Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? I'm very well. So, thank you very much for taking some time to talk with me. My pleasure. Uh, we're here to talk about this new album, which I have to say is a beautiful thing. Well, two albums in a way. Um, thank you. It's been, it's been out a few days. What's been the most surprising thing about the reaction you've heard so far? It's hard to tell. Really, I think um, I've been very pleasantly surprised that people uh, seem to be enjoying this. You know, it's a, it's um, it's been a long time since it was finished. So I've delivered masters for this, uh, for the, you know, for the final albums in the well, first of April, I think. So it's been a, a long time finished in that regard. But then it's all the other things that have been added to it. You know, the the atmos mixing. Uh, all the videos, all the visuals, everything. So it's been a long journey. So now it's more like relief that everything is out there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I, I haven't had any like this particular reactions. But people seem seem to be uh, enjoying it, and uh, also I gotten a lot of feedback that I was, you know, I I hope this album would feel like a whole cohesive thing, and uh, all along. You know, I've gotten feedback that people feel like they're yeah, they're watching a story. You know, like they're watching a an imaginary movie kind of thing. And that was a lot of yeah. the inf- inspiration going into it. So I guess that was uh, a pleasant surprise. Yeah. So having the two sides to this album, the, the metal album and the orchestral version, did you have a, a kind of a vision of how people would choose to listen to the music side by side? No, not really. I. Uh, for better or worse, I I don't really have much thought for how people <laughs> will perceive it, because I mean I've been doing this for the better part of thirty years now, and if it's one thing I know, I you know have no way of knowing how people will respond to anything. So I never make that part of the plan. Yeah. The only it's kind of rule of thumb that I could rely on is like I try to make the best possible album that I can with the time and experience and resources I've had available. And uh, and that's what it is. And uh, so far, you know, people have seemed to have been enjoying what I do to the extent that I get to do it, you know, again and again. And beyond that, I have no disillusions of trying to expect. And I think I think uh, I would do everybody this favor and myself included if I started to to try and and imagine and try to fit music to expectations. In particular, with this kind of music, it's not really uh, what people are drawn to. I think people are drawn to something that is this is real for its own thing, and not pretending to be anything else. So, so uh, I try to stick with that, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But like these days with streaming and everything, a lot of people kind of jump in and out of certain tracks and like. I hate it, but some point, some people might even put an album on shuffle. But obviously, this album, you benefit from this album by sitting down and listening to it in its entirety in the correct order. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's kind of doing everything wrong in twenty twenty four. Like <laughs> doing like a not a double album even. It's like a dual album with two parallel storylines that lead into each other, and it's a, a cohesive narrative behind everything and reoccurring themes. There's like a super tall order for people's, you know, young people's attention span that is literally no longer than ten seconds, it seems. <laughs> so, so, so in that respect, like doing everything wrong. But uh, it just the kind of the generations of music that I I was brought up on, you know, where albums to me were a cohesive whole and not just a collection of songs. Um, and uh, you can still see that, you know, we still revere albums like dark side of the moon or and any you know i huge iron maiden fan growing up and still you know so it's just, just for me when my my kind of attachment to something like seven son of a seven son or power slave or any of these albums that you know you could almost when i listen to them it's almost like you could you know sense smells and stuff from back in that time it's and you look at the artwork and listen to the music and it kind of makes sense. It, and I would read all the liner notes and all the lyrics and everything to kind of get it. And 
fortunately, I would say, I had no opportunity to see what, you know, the guys in Iron Maiden had for breakfast that morning, you know, or, you know what I mean? It was, the, the mythical element of it was still very much alive. And uh, that was part of the experience. So, And I think just subconsciously, that is the blueprint for me for what uh, constitutes an album. And uh, I think it's just, you know, it, it's not like I, I have any particular you know, concrete ideas about it. It's just like I do that instinctually because that's just how how it is for me. <laughs> so there is a narrative to this record, but how how do you kind of balance it between telling a story but still allowing the listener to kind of have their own interpretation of it? No, I uh, and I've said this many times. I, it's not important for me that people get my story. You know. Uh, I feel that by me kind of writing just this backbone, this kind of synopsis of a novel, uh, you know, as a backbone to write the lyrics and to follow with light motifs and, and a musical ebb and flow of a traditional story, uh, is enough, hopefully, for people to, to get a sense of that cohesiveness, you know, and, and feel the storyline. And, and of course, you will get hints in a sense, from from the lyrics and the titles and everything. And, um, uh, but then again, how deep you choose to go, you know, and how interesting you feel that, that is, is, of course, up to to each individual. And I, I, I like to think that in spite of all its layers and seeming complexity of how it was put together, I, I hope that it's still... You know, it's it's not intended to be some kind of uh, hard puzzle to listen to. I I, I like to think that uh, it's still very accessible up front, if you will. But I'm thinking, uh, I've, I've sometimes compared it to to a building. It's like I wanted to make a, something impressive as a big building, and some people might watch it from the outside. It's like oh, that's a that's a cool building, and move on. Others might want to go inside, and I try to decorate the rooms inside too. That's, <laughs> I guess. So for those inclined to do so, hopefully there's more, you know, that can spark the imagination and and further deepen the the experience of the music, you know, over time. And and uh, and this is just like an ideal scenario that I could hope for, because just on the, on the premises of me loving those albums myself that I kind of experienced something new and like I, I felt I found a new layer to it on each repeated listen. You know, that's how I grew very attached, you know, to to some of these albums growing up. So where did this album actually start for you? What was the what was the initial like spark for it? Like with any album it's like I there's nothing and then suddenly I can I get kind of like an instinctual notion of what the album sounds like and feels like without any chords or anything so, or music. It's like, like an, like an instinct. And then it's, that usually sticks with me pretty hard. And it's all about trying to find, you know, then figure out the sounds, the imagery, the scenes, if you will, that, that needs to be in there. So you kind of, uh, yeah, you carve it out over time. And um, on a more practical note, you know, it's, it, it, I've been doing a lot of experimental albums, you know, like a bit to this side, a bit of that to that side, just to, to explore. And it's been a long time since um, my last full length. And yeah. I've gotten to do a lot of other things in, in, in the meantime. So I, I think it was natural for me to kind of come back down the center, you know, doing black metal, but, you know, traditional symphony orchestra set up and, uh, and core the uh, archetypes in the lyrics and a very traditional storyline in, in many respects, but to try to take all these kind of familiar ingredients to me, you know, since the very beginning of my, my career and try to, what can I say, you know, subjectively to myself, try to elevate those ingredients into something new. And that's kind of where I felt instead of trying to 
I always try to, as I said, try to keep one foot in in the safe zone and one in chaos. That's kind of on the edge there is usually where I find I do my best work. And sometimes that is like relying again as reoccurring in my in my music, you know, the black metal voice, distorted guitars. This is kind of my most fluent way of expressing myself. And then I try to add elements that are unfamiliar, that I can kind of, you know, see, see if I can make things meld in, in a way. But this time it, it was a different approach. And also, you know, to, to try and rely on things that are familiar to me, but just to go much, much deeper. Um, that was the challenge. And of course, the puzzle of uh, this is probably, uh, I, I wanted to kind of pay homage to the early influences, also from soundtracks. I mean, mentioning like Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams and Bernard Herrmann, you know, the, the kind of soundtracks that was a gateway for me into orchestral music and my, my interest for that. And um, to take a deep dive into those kind of uh, harmonic textures, etc. And uh, as I've been doing a lot of, you know, su- supplementing my music to with orchestral elements over time, of course, I've always heard how a lot of the more subtle details disappear. Uh, of course, in a dense mix. So, so uh, I kind of had a, this idea of, in a blunt way, maybe write an imaginary soundtrack within the context of a black metal record. So, really, some some people have think that I've kind of done an orchestral version of the, of the same music, but literally, the orchestral version is the the exact same musical stems that's in the metal version. So that that was the puzzle I wanted to make. Uh, an orchestral arrangement that would work as a support for the metal arrangement, but also function individually as its own thing. That was kind of the big challenge. And uh, by doing, I mean, I've been doing a lot of mistakes in that in the past before, as many of other metal musicians who kind of uh, dabble with orchestral sounds, that you have this big, dense metal arrangement and then you try to superimpose like a huge dense orchestral arrangement on top of it. And as a consequence, both elements have to be smaller, which is not your intent. So so um, I, I wanted to, with this kind of duality that I, I, I planned for the album, it was interesting for, to me to just explore different dynamic and emotional impacts of the same music in a sense where... The, literally where where the metal part needs to be big you know it's very dense the orchestral parts could step back and where the metal arrangement was more open and uh, and not so dense you know the, the orchestral parts could shine through more and as a consequence you will get almost like a dynamic mirroring so i've been using the example of the first single pilgrimage to oblivion where you know it's like super hard from the get-go it's like a scale run and straight into black metal and blast beats and everything, but the orchestral version it's it's literally the same music and the same riff, even in the same range. But it's like whispery choir, tremolo cellos. It was like the same music, but uh, a different impact. Which just as as an experiment and just like from a musical perspective was very, you know, kept me very entertained and and excited. Was that duality there from the beginning of the project, or did it kind of reveal itself over time? That, that was that was the plan for the beginning, okay. To 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 write it like that. So, literally, I wrote both albums kind of at the same time because I I sketched it out as a piano short score with all the elements that needed to go in just with piano sounds, and then literally just uh, kind of assigned, you know, the bass parts to the bass instruments where that was an electric bass or bassoons and uh, and uh, cellos and contrabasses. Or you know chordal structures that would go to the guitars, and maybe the flute section or the brass section, you know. So it's uh, so it was like really just charcoaling out all the details, kind of 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 the all the music, and then applying it to to the two ensembles, if you, if you will. And yeah. that was the only way I could really write it to make it kind of fit together and 
apart. Yeah. It's a very ambitious project. I think that's an understatement. Very much. Uh, very much so, but but only you know subjectively from from my part, uh, you know it's it's ambitious, but uh, but the most for, for me personally, the most gratifying side of of this whole project is probably how much I learned in the process about orchestration, for sure, you know, and not only like you know voicings and uh, and everything, but just like creating those. More subtle organic texture, the background ground textures, you know, of, of woodwinds and everything. There were so many layers, uh, and uh, from a technical programming point of view, you know, like using all these sample libraries and like the technical side of all of that. When when it's supposed to be that detailed, uh, I uh, I had these kind of rules for myself to s- steer away from any diatonic chord progressions. To really, you know, force myself to focus on, on, uh, you know, polychords and uh, octatonic scales and and messiah modes, all these kind of harmonic colors that I associate with my favorite soundtracks, but that you know, theoretically and practically, is something that I, I never really got a grasp of, uh, and uh, yeah, there is so many elements to this. Uh, you know the, the the rewards of reusing, you know themes. You know, like doing you, working with light motifs. You know, moving moving chord progressions from one song to another. You know, but in a different arrangement. All of these things. It's uh, it was like extremely interesting. Super hard because I have no musical education. You know, like all self taught and and uh, I know of course that there are young kids who. To kind of just do orchestral scores like this for breakfast, you know, on their on their laptops. But for for me, it was uh, uh, a lot of new new elements. You know, I've been dabbling before, but this was uh, like a, on a whole different level for for me. Is is working with an orchestra like an actual live orchestra something that you would be interested in? Yeah, for sure. But uh, but mind you, only if it was a very good live orchestra. <laughs> because the the I, and I get this all the time now. Like, oh, will you be performing this music with a live orchestra? Of course, I'd love to, but it would have to be then in the capacity of that actually being better. And of course, it would be so you know objectively better if it's an amazing orchestra. But I know this from from colleagues, you know, who have been doing you know both mockups and also adding orchestral, real orchestral elements to to their music that. You know, you, you think it to just like immediately be better, but you really need, you know, to get. There are so many uh, orchestras that can do orchestral music, but to get them to just play, you know, get the transients in time with this kind of production, or some of the more intense hybrid, uh, uh, you know, soundtracks, the scores, you know. It, it's an, quite a different thing. It's not as fluent as some of the orchestral things. You know, it's, just, it's a different world. Uh, so so uh, if you're supposed to do something like that and make it worthwhile, it would need to be, you know, the an orchestra that could actually uh, uh, deal with those technical aspects of it. And, uh, and uh, I, I have checked and... Uh, uh, I'm figuring it's, it's at least like a hundred thousand euros to to start a project like that. But by all means, it, it I, you know for for the, and that was more for myself. I didn't need to do it like that for for the actual outcome. But I I literally did write it as if I wrote it for a real orchestra. So I think uh, there's nothing that's on the album that wouldn't be played. It's like I played, I had separate writings for like. Contrabass, cellos, violas, first violin, second violins, you know, every instrument. So you could literally like print that out and I'm sure, you know, get it adapted with, uh, with some, some, uh, uh, line movements and everything. But, uh, but it's written to be performed as, as an orchestra. Maybe someday, maybe if, uh, people enjoy the album and someone has a, an idea of, Making some event down the line, I yeah. don't know. I'd love to but say I, I, 
Yeah, yeah, me, me too. But it's like it, it, it had to be worthwhile, not like a gimmicky thing. There's been suggested like, a, oh, we did perform this with the, like a uh, string quintet or something like that. Like that's something that looks nice on stage. Like it, like, but it, it doesn't really add. It's, it's like then they would be kind of miming to backing cracks, and that wouldn't be. Then it's kind of <laughs> you're back in the same same place in a sense. I, I have a very practical, you know, uh, approach to this that whatever means necessary to get kind of the the idea across in the best way possible. I know even, you know, heard even like high budget, you know, composed like Hans Zimmer will sometimes even stick with the sampled short articulations, you know, from, from an orchestra just because it's it makes sense. You know, to get it in in that correct timing and just like for the sonic texture that they're supposed to to the role that they need to fill, and um, uh, yeah, it, it's a practical sense to it. Was any orchestral or classical music being played in your house when you were growing up? No, not really. When did yeah, you get introduced to it? Yeah, through, through horror movie soundtracks. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that, like in your teenage years, you kind of started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early teenage years, you know, when playing heavy metal, you know, watching films, and you know, kind of indulging in that everything that was dark and dangerous and everything. And these, you know, to this day, Jerry Goldsmith's The Omen is probably one of my absolute favorite soundtracks. Yeah, iconic. You know, yeah, it's iconic stuff, and you know, Alien and. Even though I know it, it, that was more more of controversy with him and the director on that one, but uh, uh, you know Star Star Trek, uh, and but of course everything John Williams. But you know it, it's a gateway, and so, like you listen to as I've said, you listen to the Imperial March, and like oh John Williams, wow, and, and then someone's like, have you heard have you heard Gustav Holst, the planets? <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, he he had his uh, his uh, inspirations too for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and then you kind of the the, the ball starts rolling in a, in a sense. As it's with anything, if it's literature or or metal music, it's uh, you just follow the prompts, you know. Uh, this is probably a question you've been asked. I'm sure. Would you like to do some more soundtrack work? I'd love to. I've never done. It's a, it's a, a, a dream of mine for many many years. But then again, I'm I'm kind of realistic that. That of course, what I've done with this album, you could say, it's a show reel of, you know, without all the extra extremity of, of the guitars and, and screaming and everything. That's too much probably for, for most people. Uh, but then again, I I I see this all the time that people can do, this kind of traditional orchestral mock-ups. That that's kind of the, the minimum level you have to be at, to 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 get a gig like. You know, do a soundtrack for something. So I'm, I'm not dis- disillusional about <laughs> any of that. But, but then again, you see people with uh, a less uh, traditional uh, background, musical background, doing doing soundtracks. You know, with no by no comparison, but something somewhere like you know, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Ross yeah. You know, Ludwig Göransson has more of a pop pro- producer rock background. I think even Hans Zimmer, he doesn't really read and write music that well. You know, he comes from a, a pop experimental, you know, programming mm. kind of background. So, so, uh, so, um, it'd be amazing to be part of something like that. But, uh, but uh, yeah. let's face it, I come from a very. Um, uh, it's not like I'm in the middle of things <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. musically. This album, it feels like a soundtrack to a movie that doesn't exist yet. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So congratulations. You seem in a very good place at the moment. And as a fan, it's really nice to see you kind of pushing the boundaries still after all these years. So, yeah. Well, well again, that, that's what it's all about. And that's what it, and And if anything, as I, I was talking about, you know, my the most gratifying part of this maybe being all I learned. but. Literally at age, you know, forty-eight, and having been doing this, you know, for the better part of three decades, you know, to be, to be working on this album, learning so much, adding so much to my toolbox, 
and being, you know, this feeling of excitement. And of course, failure, and it was hard, and like I was doubting myself and everything, but like to see it through and to kind of, I really felt I was, I bit over more than I could chew. You know, sometimes I feel like I, I, it was too ambitious, you know, subjectively to me, but then to kind of see it through and see that all the hard work and extra effort really made a huge difference. Uh, it somehow made me even more excited for, you know, getting into the process of the next album. And I, I'm not, I'm, I know it sound probably sounds like, uh, you know, big ego trip or whatever, but this is, honestly, it has nothing to do with this. I'm just so, I feel so fortunate and grateful to be in a position where I'm, I'm loving this still so much. You know, because I think inevitably there are so many people who who lose that relationship to then to the very igniting moment of why they ended up doing doing music in the first place. Yeah, I think it's so easy to get led astray and end up in a situation where everybody else, you know, benefits from you doing what you do, but you're actually not actually enjoying it yourself. And I think it's it's so important to keep that precious yeah i think that's the perfect way to wrap up the interview so thank you very much for your time well, i wish you continued success and hopefully thank I'll you so much for the support live. yeah i'm excited I'm, i mean th this whole week is all in between interviews and stuff it's all rehearsal and pre-production -pre and everything so i'm doing my first show with new material on the 3rd of march in in london so i'm looking forward to to playing the song slide i think they they have an energy that is will lend itself well to that format yeah well i'm in montreal but i'm british so i kind of <laughs> have a foot in both camps but um i've seen you play with emperor and solo in montreal and i saw you play with emperor mm -hmm. when you headlined bloodstock in the uk um, oh cool which was an unbelievable performance that was like one of my highlights but um, yeah, hopefully oh, it won't you. be. Hopefully it won't be long before we see you back on these shores. And uh, yeah, I hope so. Continued success, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you.